with drew evans i just want to say love the last name <laughs> it's a good one it's a good one it is a good one how are you doing today sir i'm you know can't complain it's a little uh hasn't been as sunny here in san francisco as i would like but otherwise can't complain that's i mean i totally yeah for sure feel it because i'm in san francisco as well so that's great yeah. sure. so i guess you know just starting in because I love your photos, basically. Thank you. I'm like in, basically lately on the Grantastic, we've been having a lot of film photographers come in just because it's amazing what all of you guys do out there <laughs> and girls, like um, seeing the shots you guys take and particularly with your shots, I'm so fascinated with like the images you get, the, you know, how you, when you look through a lens or rangefinder, wherever your camera you're using, like what catches your eyes? What makes you decide you want to take that photo? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think it's it changes so much. But for me, and I, I don't want to speak for a lot of other film shooters out there, but for me, it's something that I like to see light. I like to see color, but I don't like to let those things be the main focus of my image. I like nostalgia. I like... The, I said to somebody other, the other day that I like making people feel something. Um, and so if I see a scene, if I see a composition that makes me feel something, um, I want to try and capture it and share it and make people feel something too. Um, so a lot of my images tend to be um, kind of wide open landscapes with soft light, single people out there in the world. I think they're, they're, they always make me feel some nostalgia or some, some feeling. And so it's, it's, I like to try and capture that and share that out with people. No. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're doing a great job. So <laughs> that, Thank you. that helps, but yeah, I think <laughs> really your images, like, like I feel something for sure, because um, it's interesting. I think like how photography can relate to music in a way. Because mm -hmm. um, like my job is music, like that's what I do. I, you don't see the sitar right here. Yeah. That's literally, it's what how I pay the bills, and it's like with music, it's how like chords or like harmonies or voicings or chord progressions can make you feel that words can. I feel like you can totally relate that into your shots, like you said. How yeah. You shots. Yeah. I mean, I, I've I've grew up playing music also, so I've been in bands my whole life, playing guitar my whole life. And um, especially in the last handful of years, uh, the type of music I've, I've just naturally kind of been attracted to is this like atmospheric guitar, all that stuff. So I, I, for a while when I was playing music, I would basically, it sounds weird when I say it out loud, but I would sit in my room kind of try and turn off all the lights and just get a sense of what was going on outside and try and just play whatever was coming to me. And so I do a similar thing when I'm photographing now is I like to have my headphones in with some light music in the background, just like walking around to see what, what catches my eye. So um, it definitely sounds weird. No, nah, man. Saying it out loud, but you know, it's, not, it's the creative it's, process, right? <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's totally the creative process. It's not weird at all. I think whatever gets you in your zone and helps yeah. you uh, get that creativity. Cause sometimes like creativity, it, it's hard to get, like yeah. you get into the zone where it's like, or a few or rut, you could say like nothing's happening. So whatever you got to do to get it moving and grooving, I say yeah. by all means do it. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, the rut thing is, is hard. There was a period of time where, and I, I like, I know Instagram is like not, the thing to measure any success by. And I tried, it's obviously hard to do. I try not to, you know, watch those things too much, but there's a period where I just stopped posting Instagram for like a year. I uh, wasn't on it at all. Cause I just couldn't, I didn't have that drive to photograph. And for whatever reason, I don't know, six, seven months ago, I was like, you know what? I'll get back into it. <laughs> I'm going to try again. Well, I mean, I think it's good to take a break. I think there was like it was last year, like that whole like Netflix series about like 
I forget what it was called, but it's like, well, basically how Instagram just tries to pull you in and all that. And they, they like the corporation, they don't even let their kids use the app because they know how mind fucking it is. So it's like, yeah. So it, I think, you know, good for you. Cause I definitely understand that it can suck you in and like your followers and numbers. And it's like, you totally forget about living in the moment yeah. around you. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I think we all kind of fall prey to it. I definitely watch things and keep an eye on numbers. And, um, but I think the biggest thing that I've tried to learn, and again, still trying to figure it out, but even if I do watch numbers, even if I try and count followers and count likes and stuff, I try not to let it dictate what I'm going to shoot next mm. or what I'm going to post next. And I actually created like a, a second burner account <laughs> just to post the, all the other things that I feel may not be, I don't know, quote, good enough for my main account, but I still want to share it. I still want to put it out there. And um, yeah, it is, it can be hard not to like, let the masses sway what you shoot yeah. you know definitely so i guess so i love how we started this but i guess going back a little just to, yeah so um because i'm so intrigued now about the music i know this is about films so like <laughs> this podcast can literally go in different directions just like stepping a few uh, steps back so you are you born and raised in san francisco no i was i kind of lived everywhere i was born in chicago lived grew up mainly in philadelphia Okay. Uh, lived in LA, lived in Seattle, lived in Austin, Texas. Uh, but I've been in San Francisco for seven or eight years. Um, so I guess by Bay Area standards, kind of a native at this point, you know? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Okay. And like the music was like, so was that the primary goal when you first, like you wanted you to be a musician and then somehow you got into photography or? I grew up I'm one of the I'm I'm another one of those kids who was like my parents maybe take piano lessons like nope. I hated it and then came back to music years later started playing guitar when I was in high school and I think I don't think I always liked playing music I was like being bands I always like doing all that but I, I also think I never expected it to actually turn into a career so you know, I do my normal, went to school, got my degree, did all that stuff. Do I have my normal job? But I think I would go in, in, in waves back and forth between playing a lot of music and then photographing a lot and kind of go back and forth. And it's always just kind of one of the two have been my creative outlet for now 15 years at this point. So, um, I'm in my photography zone right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So do we still like when you, I guess, do you still make music per se or no? It's more like a photography, like you're saying, it's the main goal now. Right now, it's the main goal. I mean, I've still got my guitars and my amps and stuff, and they're all sitting there, but they've been collecting dust for the last six months to a year. So I've been thinking a lot in the last couple of weeks about breaking them out again. So um, yeah, man, we'll, we'll see. Wanted, we'll if, see. You ever, if you ever want to jam, just let me know. <laughs> yeah, anytime. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool to hear that. I mean, it's great, like, you know, going to different places for creativity and like, what got you into photography? Like, was it someone in your family or a close or a friend or what got you to pick up that film camera? Or yeah. Camera? Yeah, I started on digital. My mom, um, so my mom's worked in the photography industry since I was in high school. And sorry, mom, if you watch this, but she, she doesn't know it. She can't photograph. She's not very good at it. Um, and <laughs> And it was just never, that's never her. She's, she's really talented with music. So she was kind of the influence of music, but she started working in the photography industry, um, got to know a lot of photographers, met a lot of people. And she had a good friend that worked at Nikon. And a long time ago, they had their like entry level digital, like DSLR. And so she got me that for, for my birthday one year when I was 16. And I, of course, as a lot of, entry-level digital photographers do I like set my lens to sit at you know at f1.8 okay. never took it off of that thought that that was like I was incredible because I knew how to get the background blurry right mm -hmm. um and so yeah started digital shot digital for most of my life until um 
actually earlier this year, I just, for whatever reason, it felt like all my digital shots were kind of, I don't know that they were turning out the same, but they didn't give me that same like yeah. feeling and desire that I wanted. So I kind of sold a bunch of stuff and said, you know what, worst case is I'll buy a film camera. I'm terrible at it and go back to, <laughs> to digital. And, um, yeah, I've kind of stuck with it. It's unfortunate because I got here at the wrong time in terms of cost and pricing, but it's, yeah, uh, it's been fun otherwise. It's expensive. I don't know how, like, just like, because I get it. Like, I didn't know how much it cost too, because my grandfather has a Leica. Mm. And like, I was like, oh, how much can you get? And I was like, wow, it, you could sell it for this <laughs> fucking much? Are you fucking kidding me? Like, yeah, it's, it's funny. I was out photographing like two weeks ago and I ran into this older couple and I had my, my Leica and I was walking up some path. Um, in in san francisco and they were the woman stops me and she's like is that a is that a leica and i was like yeah and she's like is that do people still use those these days and i was like you have no idea and she was like my you know my dad has a big collection he's got like four or five leicas and i was like can we if, if you're looking for someone to to donate them to it's definitely got, it sounds like she's just like they're just sitting there it's like if she doesn't want yeah them. And she was like, well, can you turn them into digital? And I was like, don't, no, but also don't do that. Yeah. They're five times more valuable right now if they're filmed. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if, I don't know if there's a handful of Leicas that just entered the market from some random woman in San Francisco, but um, yeah, I, I, I wish my, I wish we had old cameras back in my family, but we don't, unfortunately, we don't have any sitting around. Yeah, I mean, like, it was just a weird thing. My grandfather was into fucking like a he I mean, he was born and raised in Germany. So like, yeah, that, that's what he did for a living. I guess. I mean, he was a doctor, but also shot photography on his like on the side. And I guess he was really into it. And, I, and it's like, yeah, just was sitting here. So that's so cool. So that, have you, do, do you have have you been able to find any of his old like negatives and stuff? Has he shown you any old so, work? So I found the scrapbook of all the photos. Mm. So, and it's just amazing seeing the black and white photos back yeah. then, seeing what they're wearing and like his angles and how he shot and everything. And like, I mean, he, I don't know if you could say skill because I'm not a photographer, but <laughs> in my eye, it's like, damn, he could shoot. So yeah, that's awesome. Definitely inspiring. And it's like to get to that level, I, I'm just curious what, like, what, like what is failures for? Like, what did he realize? Like, when he was shooting because back then i'm always curious like how they i'm, I'm assuming i guess it's the same because the film camera still hasn't changed at all yeah so. yeah i don't know that's a good question i mean now it's interesting because i recently have started to shoot a lot more black and white and it's been it's been a tough transition just because i mean the instagram world out there these days I, like so many people like the color yeah. film look and it's like the goal and a lot of my shots are that way and I black and white like shooting black and white obviously there's no color but it it, it changes the way you Think. view things and I'm it's I mean I think it makes somebody it who only shoots color yeah I mean if somebody who only shoots color it's really hard um but it also like I've started to realize that in a lot of cases, I kind of use color as a, as a crutch a little bit. Like if something's like in San Francisco, I mean, you've seen this a million times, like all the houses here are really bright and colorful and oh, yeah. it's super cool and it makes for some really amazing images, but I also don't want that to be the only thing I know how to shoot. Cause yeah. if I ever leave San Francisco or if I try something new, I don't want color to be the only thing I know. Um, and so like these old black and white photographers, uh, that's what's so incredible to me is how they see light and how they see contrast and like shadows and stuff. And I, I, I wish I, I wish I started with black and white. It would make, I think I'll make things a lot easier now. No, definitely. Like everything you said, it's like when those were the words I was looking for, for my grandfather. <laughs> like, like you, I mean, you're just a film protector. So you understood. I'm just grasping here with some of the knowledge I have for it, but like, exactly. Like it's, like, don't get me wrong, like, 
shooting color it's great it's beautiful but yeah. I feel like black and white like that really helps your skill because then you have to totally. really get creative and then like how things like with the darkness shadowing and like mm -hmm. and i don't know like yeah man it's the best way it's to a totally it. different skill it really is it's like it's like i guess from because most people who listen here are musicians it's like yeah. being in a scale and really trying to go take it to a whole new level folks it's like being in e minor flat and trying to do something cool with it yeah really know yeah it. Uh, I'll tell you a random story that uh, my music related for all these music listeners out there, my, um, cause I feel like you guys would appreciate it. My best friend, his mom, um, plays viola in the LA Philharmonic and she's been, she's been doing it for uh, 20 years at this point, but I found out pretty recently that she actually joined the LA Phil as a violinist and like three or four years after decided one day that like violin was not her instrument. She didn't want to play it anymore. And so she went to the conductor and was like, I want to switch to something else. I want to switch to viola. And he was like, you have three months to figure it out. And in three months, she figured out how to not only learn the new instrument, but also get it to a point where she was good enough to be in the LA Philharmonic again in a new instrument. And then wow. now she's like first chair. And it's just like, picking up that skill that quickly and learning. I mean, the instrument may not be that different, but it's different enough that it's a whole. Yeah. Thing. I mean, congrats to your friends. Like, <laughs> because like, I don't think people realize how long it takes to like learn an instrument. Like I had to do like a recital yesterday. Yeah. And, and so it was like bossa nova and um, you know, the classical guitar, it's kind of my thing, but yeah. more and more pianos and more like sitar. So I really wasn't like fully confident. So, but like, you know, you got to fake it till you make it. So like, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, with the audience out there really got to like try to hit these like, you know, ninths and sevens and 13th yeah. chords and really stretching. But like, yeah, it's not like, cause string instruments are like, you think it like, oh, obviously it's going to be the same, but no, totally. Not even a little bit. How you have to tilt it, how the tension, the playing it's, yeah, it's incredible. It's crazy. Yeah. She told me that story and I was, I was, blown away and i was like man i thought that the shift from shooting digital to film was hard can't even imagine bro i like i don't know like because the whole like could i got into film like i'm not gonna I'm not gonna not gonna like promote my film out here so then <laughs> please do not, like not gonna be that guy because i'm definitely not at that level definitely i'm interested in it actually i had a, a person that i think you no, you definitely follow jaime uh, he goes like, yeah, 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 yeah. So he came on here. He was the first one. And yeah, like, no way. Yeah, I was just talking to him recently. He does all these. He, he does all these things on Instagram where he posts things and tries to make people guess the film. Yeah, and that, I, he messages me a lot, telling me about how bad people's guesses are. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's how we first met. Like, not because of my bad guess, because he's like, "Wow, I'm proud of you. You're the only one who got the guess." And I was like, "Yeah." yeah. And then, like, thanks, man. So then. So he was the first film photographer who came on here. Nice. And then, you know, we started talking about film and just like everything. And then he kind of like, cause I started with like, you know, AE1 found it. That was like, my grandfather had all these cameras. That was the one that was the most functional. Took yeah. it, that's what I learned on. And he's like, yeah, man, you really got to get into it. And like, he just got a, a Hassel, is it Hassel? Uh, Hasselblad? Yeah, he got that yeah. and he's really excited about. And he's like, and I told him like the dream was like, yeah, I like it. It would be cool if I could fix my grandfather's one or something. That'd be so cool. Um, but then he's uh, with the story going on. He's like, yeah, I try to figure out. So basically the story is he has helped me so much in film photography. He yeah. has been the guy who tells me like that photo is shitty. No, you need to do it this way. Come on, guy. This is understand the lighting here. So he's yeah, like, no. but you know what you need? You need someone like that. First of all. Yeah. His work is so cool. He shoots, he shoots a lot at like, I mean, you've seen, but like dusk and like evening. And I'm, that's something I don't know how to do because shooting, especially film at that time of light, like if you don't have the right amount of light, you really got to figure it out. You got to work on it. Um, so he's fantastic at that. But um, yeah, you need someone to like break you down a little bit. Oh, you know? no. Yeah. You want someone it's to be constructive, true. right? Exactly. Like, Again, music, you want like a mentor yeah. or something who could tell you like, 
when you say like that is off or that's not you're not playing it right because you don't want to have those people like i don't know if it's the right word fake people but like they're always like yeah this is great or sounds totally. great it's like you don't need that fakeness you want someone you know can like give you good criticism but that like it's like tough love basically yeah and that's what he's doing yeah and it's funny because i feel like some of the stuff on instagram like when i post something and it gets you know a certain number of likes and I post something else it gets like half or a quarter of that of like an average post i try to look at it as as I try to take a step back and look at the image as to like, okay, what, not saying that everybody here is the perfect critic, but what didn't work about this image? Is it something that, you know, I thought was great? Was I trying too much with color? Was it just not a composition that worked? Um, and while, you know, I still like some of those images and I'll, I'll still keep them, um, I try to use that as like a, barometer a little bit but it's um i mean again instagram is a whole other well it's it's conversation it, it, no i mean like yeah i'm just i'm so fascinated by it because like how like because i i kind of like asked jaime about it but we haven't gone really deep into it it'd be great to have both of you next time on it like yeah i would love to that'd be great just to talk to you guys and be a group one um but it's just like I think all you guys' photos are great, but do you guys focus, and I fully, I think I know the answer to this, is to what you think is a good photo or to what the Instagram viewer wants? Because it's hard. Yeah. Like, I'm I'm just shooting because I enjoy it. That's why. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the ideal, right? Like, the ideal is you shoot because you enjoy it and you post things and you don't really care what the outcome is. I think... I think there's always a little bit of back and forth, at least for me. I don't want to speak for everyone, but there's always a little bit of back and forth of like, sometimes I just post things because I like them and I want it to be a part of my collection of images. I want it to be a part of my portfolio. And for a lot of people, Instagram kind of is the portfolio that you use. Um, and so maybe it's not going to be the image that will make me, you know, happiest or whatever but it's something that i'm i'm happy enough with that i'll post it um there are always going to be images that i feel like i should post i was just having this conversation earlier where uh i just scanned in some stuff last night and found some image and i was like shit instagram's gonna love this it's not my favorite thing in the world but based on what i know that other people like and what what popular right now I feel like this is something people would like. So do I post it? Yeah. Do I want to? Sure. But but you have that second account though. So where you Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like that's where I really try. I post more black and white stuff there because that's what I'm trying. But I, I like so I'm super inspired and I, I find a lot of um yeah, I'm super inspired by architecture and fashion also mm -hmm. and so a lot of the a lot of the images that I try and test out I usually have a handful of, of images per roll that are like really architecture focused and that it's just like lines and shapes and like you may not be able to tell what it is but it's like the corner of a building and another corner and sky and it's just like super minimal and um like i'm not gonna post that anywhere but maybe i'll post it on the second account but it's where i like to try things more and i don't care about who likes it i don't care about who shows up it's just well i think you gotta do what you gotta do whatever you're yeah. whatever true to your heart and i think yeah and also when it comes to your shots like this is some basic film thing i'm gonna ask is like no please um like you know there's like there's like techniques when you shoot and everything so like mm -hmm. you shoot i'm assuming you have all this in your head when you're trying to shoot it's not like you go out take the camera oh this looks good mm -hmm. like yeah i mean that's not yeah it. there are definitely techniques and and actually it was one of the harder things moving from film to did or from digital to film yeah. was that 
digital just allows you so much more flexibility in terms of what you can and can't shoot. You know, if I see some composition and I think it might be interesting, I can take a hundred shots and frame them slightly differently and like change the angle slightly and change the lighting and the aperture and all that stuff. Take a hundred different shots, get home, put them all into my computer and see what, see what works best. And obviously with film, I mean, you could do that. You would waste a ton of money if you did that, but yeah, it's, it's a lot different and obviously it makes you slow down a lot. It makes you think about your compositions a lot more, which I love, but it was tough going from that mindset to don't just fire off at whatever you see. Um, and you know, techniques wise, that kind of changes how you shoot too. Cause it's, you know, you think about, I mean, the rule of thirds is a really common technique. And I don't think, I mean, I follow it sometimes. I don't think it's like the end all be all rule. I know a lot of people when you're learning photography, that's like the number one thing they tell you is mm-hmm. follow the rule of thirds. I mean, it's helpful. It's a guideline, I think, but it's not like the rule, but oh, yeah. Even something like that is, um, I try to keep those things in mind and I'm trying to keep in mind like how light works and how color works and how shapes and, you know, designs work together. So who knows if it works in the end, but. No, yeah, I think you gotta do with like, like you said, you're into architects. So you like shooting buildings and I think that's great. I think everyone has, and fashion, love it. Yeah. I that hundred percent really into like especially like i mean san francisco you see a lot of amazing people and like what Mm -hmm. they dress and i love like just walking going down like street photography i love love going you know sixth street it's it's interesting but like yeah you know um it's you know makes you get out there and gets out of your comfort zone and for sure uh but if you you know can get that shot it can be amazing Yeah. There's some really amazing street photographers out there. I don't, that's like one area of photography. I was talking to another guy on Instagram, Eddie, uh, Eddie Grog, if you're looking for a new follower. Um, He, we were talking about this recently and, and we just can't, like, I can't do street photography. I'm just, I don't know. I don't have the eye for it. I don't have the I'm too, I'm too introverted to like get up in people's faces and take pictures of people while they're looking at me. I'm like, yeah, it's, but it's such a skill and it's such, there's some incredible photographers from even like 50, 60 years ago who were so good at it. And mm-hmm. it's so cool. No, <laughs> I'm it, so it, mad at it. No, it's so cool. Like, you know, I, you know, look, look at Joe Greer, you know, like, yeah, said, totally. And then like, I've been like the biggest one the, uh, who's like been very like, inspirational is eric kim like his do you know who that is i don't know i'm sure that i probably yeah he, yeah he big like photographer he like literally has like a lot of different like us it seems like and he just right, talks about how, he, he but he talks about how to shoot and he like has like these full pdfs on like how to shoot and it's free on his mm. website and you can learn oh, that's awesome video and like I try to do one of his techniques, I forget what it's called, but basically you, you know, get your zoom focus ready and like act like you're walking into someone and then you take the photo and then be like, oh, yeah. my God. but yeah, I'm, he was in Japan and like, I guess people there was like, oh, it's okay. Sorry. You know, keep yeah. Did it on down in sixth street. Not the way <laughs> you tried to fight me. He's like, you want to come closer? I was like, nope, I'm sorry. I just yeah, never doing that again. Never again. Oh yeah. God yeah i think it's zone focusing maybe that's what they call it but like yeah there we go yeah it's um that's super common uh amongst street photographers i'm there there are a lot of really good uh youtubers out there also who uh there's like a youtube film community right now and a handful of them are actually in the bay area um and they do a lot of street photography and it's so cool to watch them do their thing because I could not even if I tried um and yeah it's it's interesting to like the other technique I I was reading about that that people try is like you know you you pretend to walk into someone you you 
if you see somebody walking into a scene that you like, you just hold your camera and pretend you're taking a picture of that scene, but really you're waiting for somebody to walk in front of you or like get in the way so you can take a picture of them. Um, I'm still too nervous to try that, but that's another one. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll try. I mean, like, I don't know. I, I think, I don't know what the worst could happen. I guess they, they get, get mad at you or they ask you to delete it, but really you can't yeah. keep film because it's on right, there. Right. So it's, you just kind of say, yep, I'll just delete it. And it's like, gone. It's yeah. gone and keep on going. But yeah, I think, yeah, it's definitely like, I mean, at least for me, it has helped like get out of comfort zone just because like, at least performing wise, like whatever happens out here, it's going to happen. It's whatever. They're never going to see me again, or maybe they will. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I think the comfort zone thing is, is, has been like, that's been something that, that, I mean, I guess photography in general has helped me kind of push out of that, but um, especially with, with film, just cause I'm used to like, I'm one of those people that like, I like seeing the results as, as quickly as I can in film. Obviously you can't do that. I don't develop on my own. I'm starting to learn how to, but um, with my last couple of roles that I shot, like I didn't drop them off at the lab for probably a week. And then I, they were ready and I didn't pick them up for a couple of days. And then I scanned them and didn't edit them for a day. And I'm like, I'm trying to even slow that down. So I'm not so like, I need these back. I need to see the results. I need to like get things to post. You know what I mean? I'm trying to like- No, exactly with that. Let that like, sit. Just like, hard. especially like, like when I first started film, uh, like that feeling, like, what does it look like? Exactly. Yeah. But I think it's, I think it's like a, an important discipline to have is to be totally. patient. Being, I mean, and that can be used for anything in life, you know, yeah. at least for me, like ADD, like you're just like, I need to see it. And it's like, you need to chill the fuck out and just like, yeah, you need to chill. Yeah. It's not yeah. going anywhere. It's there. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, I scanned and edited a couple of photos like two days ago mm -hmm. and I purposely didn't look at them again until this morning. Mm -hmm. Cause I remember when I was editing them, I was like, this is, these are great. Like, I'm really happy with these. And when I came back to him this morning, I was like, were you happy with them or were you just happy to have new images mm -hmm. to look at? Yeah. And I'm like, still, you know, still some of them I like, mm -hmm. but I'm not nearly as happy with some of the other ones. And I think giving myself that extra day was surprisingly helpful even if it ate me inside and I was trying to see them and I wanted to, you know, share them and do whatever, but it's, uh, it's better than that. That for me at least is better than, than, than digital just cause I couldn't, it's all, it's too immediate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, no, a hundred percent. It's like, it's like when you think about it, you have a phone or smartphone, and you take all these million pictures, but do you ever really look back at them? No, you might post them and, or maybe, yeah. Maybe Apple will do like a year ago, this is where we're <laughs> at. And it's like, oh, yeah. well, that's how yeah. I never look at my photos. So like the only time I actually never. look at shots is like, I'm building a scrapbook. That's why I started film because after seeing my grandfather's stuff and I think mm. it's meaningful. So when I pass or whatever, my, hopefully my kids or whoever will get to look at all the photos of what I did, what Grant did in his life. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I, I've, I've noticed that there's some photographers out there and, and there's some on Instagram who do this, but there's some who document just like everyday things. And I think I've been in the mindset for a long time of like, I want to shoot images that I can share, that I can, I don't know, like they're, they're not just for Instagram, but like put them on Instagram, put them on my website, like make prints and do the artistic side of things. Oh yeah. But there is something super valuable and super artistic about like everyday life. And one of my friends took a film camera to on vacation with her and like five of her friends and just shot a bunch of film of like them doing nothing. But even looking at those, I was like, man, I remember I've done stuff like that. Like I remember sitting around doing like that shit is nostalgic just as much as shooting some old Volkswagen on the street in San Francisco and trying to make that 
Oh my Big God. Big on Instagram, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, the whole Volkswagen. A lot of people have used the Euro shot and like, or found that Volkswagen and post the same shot. I've seen it too many times. And I was like, it's, it's funny that, and I obviously wasn't the first person on the planet to shoot that, but I, uh, my content I've seen uh, that you were, I yeah, started. I've seen a handful since I posted it. And, um, I actually saw one of the coolest things happen to me last week is that, um, a friend of mine actually, and I didn't know this was happening, painted that, that, oh, in, that, I, that shot. Yeah, you posted it, right? Paint, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Somebody painted that. That's awesome. Um, it was like. I know it's not like you're in the big time, but that was the first time I was like, huh. Okay. So somebody, one person out there at least likes that image enough, like some of my work enough to paint it. And I was like, that's, oh, yeah, that's so mean. That's pretty cool. I, I like by all means. Yeah. yeah. Like that is, that is the best feeling for sure. When, especially if you can make like move someone or like, yeah, like for all the music people, like if you have a song and like you move someone or you help them create like, create them for them to get inspired or like to change their mood like a lot of like you know music for me like if I'm down or something like I'll listen to some song and the lyrics will just touch me or whatever and mm -hmm. then make me feel or inspire or feel better so like I think same thing for photography and like don't get me wrong like that shot was like it, it well first of all it made me want to go buy a Volkswagen bus <laughs> whole, like, I'm into the whole 60s 70 era that's just like yeah. the whole era and like San Francisco is the place for sure where you can find these sure. out here. But yeah, I mean, did they send you that painting? I think he's still working on it right now, but it was like, even if they never do, even if they hang it up, even if they, whatever they do with it, mm -hmm. he still took like at uh, least a few hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah for your it, photo. Right? So like someone else's life took time of you for your photo. That's amazing. Yeah. It must have been meaningful in some way, shape, or form for him, which is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I like, I'm a huge critic of my own stuff. And um, I would never say that I'm like a photographer. I like photography and I like to shoot images, but I don't think I'm good enough, nearly good enough to say I'm a photographer. But it was still a super cool experience to, to have somebody else do that. So, for sure. And I think you make a, you, you um, hit a good point about like what makes a photographer, not a photographer and talking to other, like, you know, I mean, one of them, but there's other people for sure. And like, they talk about like numbers shouldn't make someone a photographer and mm -hmm. stuff. And like, it's interesting you saying you, you don't feel like you're a photographer because like, I think you are a photographer <laughs> and, like, and that, that, that's not just because of your numbers on Instagram by any means. It's mm -hmm. because I see the photos, how you shoot, but also your second account that I have looked there. It's just like mm -hmm. how you get some of your angles. But yeah. why, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is like, why do you think some people or younger people who I talk to think numbers is all that matters and that mm -hmm. defines your skill or your level? I think that's totally not it. You could be great and maybe have a hundred followers. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I follow plenty of people on Instagram who, you know, less than a thousand followers, less than 500 followers. And they like incredible work, incredible work. Um, the numbers thing I like on one hand, it's like the more numbers, the more people li like you. So naturally that makes you feel like you're good. I, you know, I think that there, are, I don't want to say plenty, but there are definitely people accounts photography and otherwise in general who have like huge numbers of followers who are fine they're not bad they're just they're they're fine oh yeah um, they love yeah. that saturation and just like making the <laughs> colors as, as possible in their photos yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and like and there are others, like I said, who have a couple hundred followers here and there who are like, they're producing incredibly high quality work. And it's, you know, maybe the algorithm hasn't found them yet, <laughs> maybe, maybe whatever it is. But um, it's funny, I, I, I have a lot of people reaching out to me these days that are like, how do you, like, do you have any advice on how to, to grow, how to get more followers? And I'm like, 
yeah yeah like post consistently pick a style do whatever make sure you're like trying to do it every day but also like that's not it's mentally draining yeah i for me i'll, I'll say that this is all with the caveat that like yeah this is for me right like that's not my goal yeah sure it's it's nice and i'll be excited to hit ten thousand followers and I'll, I'll be excited to hit 15 or whatever if i ever get there but like that's not my goal and um my goal is to like i said earlier like do something share something that will will have an impact on someone else um and i see images like this all the time on instagram where like i'll scroll by something and look at it for 30 seconds because it just like reminds me of something or makes me feel a certain way or whatever and like those are the ones that are powerful to me and i would like to like if i can make somebody stop and stare at an image for 30 seconds like i feel like i've done something good yeah i think that should be a goal i think it's i mean it's hard to say for someone that like i mean people have their own ideas and that's fine yeah that, that's what the world is that's the freedom of speech great yeah um but i think it shouldn't be about likes because that can be so mentally draining and just like totally and like we've seen how society or um, the social media can drain people and make them like go kind of a little bit cuckoo and mm-hmm. it's like they need to like they're not even living life anymore like you're just yeah. stuck to this phone and i think it's it's great to hear like you know you took a break from instagram and just enjoyed life and then you're like yeah. i'm coming back and yeah yeah and it's 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 funny like there are so many different obviously there are so many different types of photography and I know that I I can shoot in my own little area. And I know like portrait photographers who are incredible, who I couldn't even do that if I try. Like I, I'm, I haven't tried very often, but like portrait photography is such a skill and it's such a um, unique skill set to have. I don't have it, but I follow so many people out there who are incredible at it and some of them do like the more artistic style some of them do more like they shoot for magazines they shoot for you know whatever and likes or not they all have really they have a lot of talent and they all have a lot of skill and um i know that there have been other apps out there who have tried to do the whole like you don't like there are no likes there was one recently called glass that was around couple months ago that was super popular for a minute i don't know if it's i assume it's still around but it was like a photography app where you post your images but there was no like system so you could comment you could i think you could follow people but you couldn't see any numbers and you couldn't like an image so if you like somebody's image you had to comment or that was it but i don't know how like that would be great but i don't know how well those things are going to do because i think people are addicted to this like yeah i know now you can hide likes on instagram but that i do <laughs> oh i do too 100 percent. you know i want to see on, it on the film for sure um i think yeah i think all of that is it's kind of interesting how that can really wrap around your mind and can kind of drive you insane but yeah i think people just need to if you listen to this take a step back enjoy life go outside <laughs> it's not raining in sf then yeah sure, go out go see something yeah. but yeah what what do you feel about like I, I always ask everyone who does film photography the stance of a purist and then the lightroom or when you edit like what like yeah what's my view yeah on that yeah i think is it deceiving a little for someone or no i i i'm personally in the camp of like i i edit my photos a little bit and when i say that i mean i scan them in and when I scan, it kind of, you know, depending on what my scanning setup looks like or how what the light is, like the, the color, the white balance, the color won't be exactly how it should look. Mm-hmm. So I edit my photos to get them back to what I was seeing in real life when I shot that. And it's just color. I don't edit. I try not to edit anything else. Sometimes I'll like change the shadows and the highlights a little bit to get it a little more even, but Beyond that, like I'm not, back in when I was shooting digital, it was, I would edit things out. I would like remove light poles and 
mm. things that just were kind of in the way. Um, so my view, as I say all this, my view is like, if you're going to do it, yeah. like do it. That that's that's you know, that can be a part of your art. Like like if we view all of this as art, mm -hmm. and we view all of this as like, you know. Yeah, I guess art. Like yeah. you should have the freedom to create art in whatever way you want. Exactly. You know? Like you're gonna edit a bunch of shit in your image and try and pass it off as real when it wasn't like that in real life. Yeah, maybe not, but I think there's it's a balance. Everything's a balance. I think it's yeah. like it's a full balance. And like there's nothing wrong with it for sure. It's yeah, just, it's just Sometimes, I mean, I mean, when I first started, like when you see like some of these images, I'm like, wow, how did they do that and stuff? And then I asked Jaime, and I'm sorry, Jaime, if I'm sorry, I keep bringing you up in this, you should have just came on this podcast. But like, he's like, you know, it's edited. And I'm like, really? Yeah. It's like, yeah, fool, it's edited. And I was like, yeah. And he sent me a link and all like showing me and explaining. I was like, damn, yeah, it is. What the fuck? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's. Yeah, I, I think like if you're gonna edit, you gotta own it. Like don't pretend like you're not editing. Yeah. And if you don't pretend, like if you openly say, like, hey, yeah, this was edited slightly, not a big deal. I don't care personally. But like I there's been a huge pushback in the film community for for a while now. And I say that as if I've been around this community for a long time, but like I've seen it the entire time I've been shooting film, which is there's this like purist mentality like you said like you, you you shoot film and you can't touch it like whatever the scan is you can't touch it it's kind and of a little like, like i i personally don't agree with it but no yeah i think um i think it's it's an interesting like for like i'm just gonna use me for an example that's the best part i don't want to yeah. speak for anyone else I don't touch it because a I don't want to pay for Lightroom. I don't want to. Pay for, <laughs> that is why I don't touch it. I'm not will, and I'm not on that level of trying to be. I just like shooting for my scrapbook and then posting some of it for my family friends on my little. Yeah. You know that is why. But for someone who does it and wants to like make that connection with other people, I think it's totally fine as long as you like. You're not fully like you're saying cropping, taking out the bus in the yeah, photo, yeah, yeah. or like really then then it's fine. I don't know what's the deal. It's like kind of like old heads in music. Like they hate beat makers. Like, yeah, they, totally. It's, it's literally like the, the times are changing as Bob Dylan would say, you got to get with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just different. It's just different. And that's like, you know, there are, there are some incredible um, artists out there. I don't really know what you call them, but like they create art from images and edit them a lot and create 3d manipulations and do all this incredible work and it turns out to be something amazing mm -hmm. i think that's very different than than photography and film photography specifically but you know if you're gonna edit you just own it like i i shot some image the other day and it came back and it was like i wanted it to look a certain way and i wanted you know the trees in the foreground to be a little bit darker so it would it would make you look more at this guy running in the park in the background mm -hmm. and it just didn't quite turn out that way and so i tried to <laughs> i tried for like 20 minutes to edit the photo a little bit here and there to make it come out that way like edit the front to make it a bit darker and and the more and more I edited, the worse and worse it got. And like films, obviously, it's not the same as editing a digital image, but like it just got worse. And then it looked too fake and the colors didn't work. And I was like, this just, it is what it I is. reset the whole thing. And I was like, you know what? This is better than like, I'd rather have it look not perfect yeah. and be like, like real <laughs> than yeah. something else. I think imperfection is a is actually beautiful in its own way. You know, when it's not yeah. perfect, it it's normal. It's like in music, like quantizing. Like it's better to be yeah. off. You know, it's better to have groove and be off. Yeah. And then being right on it because, as for ears or for eyes, maybe like it's better to look a little like not perfect. Yeah, quantizing is a really good analogy for all this. Like that that going going back to that that Volkswagen van shot that we were talking about earlier. I remember when I posted that there's a big light pole in it 
-hmm. And when I originally was looking at it, I was like, how can I take this out? Because I want it to feel like 70s, the color palette, like I want it to feel like classic San Francisco. And the light pole just feels like it's in the way and doesn't fit the vibe. And I was like, I, I can't, I'm not good enough at editing to do that. And Let's even if I did, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just like, I didn't try and I posted it. And not only did I forget about it pretty quickly, no one else seemed to care. And that was just kind of like the reminder that I needed personally to be like, you know what? That's not the focus of the image. I know I focus on it because I see what I don't like, but it's not like it doesn't matter. Yeah, man. I think like for all our biggest critiques out here, like with our own stuff, it's a it's a it's a mental game and it's hard to like to like remember to focus, like what's the purpose? Like we're doing this yeah. for why. And I think that's a huge thing. And I think going back a little what you're saying, like how people edit and stuff, I think like music, like you have oh god let me let me think of a like to to compare here for people to understand um take like rock you have 60s rock and roll you know but then you have sub genres of rock mm -hmm. you know you can go to indie rock alternative rock you know different stuff jazz rock which is a thing uh shout out to i love jazz rock yeah shout out to steely dan you know yeah they're amazing it's like you would could you say that could be something for film like a sub genre if you're so you're still doing film because you have a film camera but you're doing these different edits that could be a link yeah. now yeah i mean i think it's it's that exists right like these there's a really big community of film shooters that only shoot portraits mm. and i don't know how much editing they do if any and like if you want to fully change your image it was originally shot on film like okay but like these these portrait photographers are fantastic i wouldn't consider myself like we may both be film shooters but like i don't consider myself a photographer like they are mm. i do something very different yeah. um and it's kind of like like my view on editing i guess to sum all that up is like what's that old saying where if you like replace every plank on a ship Oh, wait. Is it still the same ship? Like, if you replace every single thing in your image, is it still the same image you originally took? And, like, if you're editing that much, it's no longer an image. It's something different. Not to say that it can't be completely functional. It can't be art. It can't be great. It's just not an image. It's not like a film image uh, anymore. Yeah. So, I get it. I feel it. I totally understand that. And good analogy. Damn, we're hitting the analogies right now. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I think I butchered that saying a little bit, but it's it's it's, it's something it's, like that. It's all good. I, I'm feeling it for sure. So then, I guess going like through your times from I guess starting film, like what were struggles? You know, starting film and then starting ending. I guess now, like yeah. what what is Drew's? You know, struggles struggle with overcoming them. Yeah, yeah. I think that. I think the first big struggle that I hit, and this goes back to talking about moving from digital to film, and I'm sure that other people have gone through this, or at least that's what I tell myself. When you shoot digital images, the way it works, just like the, the, the way it hits, like the light hits the sensor, you're, the digital you know, sensor, and then it's, it keeps that information, and then you upload it to your computer, and you put it into Lightroom and you can edit it. The general rule of thumb is you expose for the highlights, meaning that for all the non photographers out there, basically just means that like, you want to make sure that your highlights, the really bright parts of your image are not completely blown out. They're not completely gone uh, because with, digital images, digital sensors, editing programs, they, they're really good at bringing back information from shadows. Mm. So if your shadows are too dark in your image, say there's like a, a, a corner, like a dark corner in a room that's really dark. When you put it in Lightroom, these programs these days are really good at retaining that information so you can 
actually edit it and actually sh bring back the shadows, bring them up so you can see more of what's there. Okay. You can't do that with highlights. So if something's really too bright, you can't then bring it back to like a normal level of brightness because it's just gone. It doesn't, the digital sensors don't retain that bright information as well. Mm. On film, it's the opposite. Film has, uh, they say it's got really, some films have really good latitude, meaning that like they do a good job of not making your image too bright when they're, when it's, when there's a lot of light. So when I went from digital to film, I started film and I was like, oh, I'll expose for the highlights. I'll make sure that my highlights are well exposed. And then I'll go in later and bring the shadows back. But what that does is, and I'm sure everybody's seen it, those like what you think of as like classic film shots where it looks kind of, the blacks almost look kind of gray and it looks like it has this like haze over it. There was a, a, a thing on Instagram where you could like, I think they called it fade, where you could like up the fade and it would kind of just add this like gray layer. There's a lot of grain and it looks like really not bad. It just doesn't look like it should. Mm -hmm. That's basically what happens. And so my first like, I don't know, 10 rolls film, I couldn't figure out what the hell I was doing wrong um, because I wasn't exposing right. And as a result, it changes the colors it changes the light, it changes like what shows up. And I just, there were so many roles that I would get home and be like, this is gonna be great for it to be terrible because I, I didn't know what was going wrong. And I heard, I remember some Instagram photographer, actually uh, Toby who lives over here, Edgewood edition, if you're looking for another guy. Um, he did some Q and A and I remember asking him like, how do you expose your shots? How do you like to expose? Being like, we all obviously know the answer, but I was like, please answer this question. I don't know. And he was like, I expose, make sure everything in the shadows is well exposed. And we don't care about the highlights. And I was like, oh my God, I've been doing this wrong the entire time. And that was like a couple months in. So that was the big one. And so I'm always trying to remember how to properly expose. That's like the most important thing in film. You can't, you got to properly expose. Digital is easier to, to screw that up and, and make it work in the end. But um, that's a big one. And I know that was a lot of like, for all the non-photographers, it's like a lot of technical. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for sure. And you're looking at like, for sure. I mean, again, Jaime <laughs> coming in here, like trying to explain this to me, sending me like photos and like examples and like yeah. diagrams and like trying to like, I think the biggest thing was like just understanding aperture, shutter speed and just like, yeah. And like the goddamn fucking light meter and all this shit. And yeah, like, I, I remember learning all of the aperture shutter speed stuff was like when I was trying to learn triads back in the music days i was like okay so what notes go with what and like you can match them together but like aperture was always really hard for me because i'm like okay a smaller number means a smaller aperture which is not true the smaller the number the wider the aperture which means more light and i couldn't get that through my head it was really counterintuitive to me for a long time oh yeah i mean i was like I was trying to, cause I, at the time, uh, uh, I was basically, I was trying to understand like, you know, the shutter speed and everything. And then I was looking at sunny 16 and I wasn't, yeah. and I was trying to understand that. And then like, I just remember, but then I didn't take in to like the idea of like, well, if my, is my object even moving fast or whatever? So, mm -hmm. I so, so I was trying to get this guy who was like on a bike and I didn't have it on a thousand. I was like, I think I was on, uh, 160th or one uh, yeah and it was just no that like <laughs> I, I got the 7016 but i didn't get like i didn't even think about like he's moving there's like so many things you're juggling yeah like i mean it's just trial and error i realized that's what it is yeah they're, they're uh if you ever have the chance to look it up there's something called the exposure value chart and it's basically like it basically prescribes a lighting situation with an exposure value 
Mm. And some old lenses, actually like a Hasselblad, for example, some of the old lenses will have exposure value readings. Basically, it's this list of like, I don't remember what it goes up to. I want to say like 15, like zero to 15 or zero to 16 or something, but each number corresponds to a different lighting scenario. This is something like an exposure value of like eight is like a pretty dark room that's not well lit. And so if you are at an eight on the chart, you'll know there are corresponding aperture and shutter speed combinations that work. Mm. And so if you like a, like a regular sunny day is probably like 14, 13 on that chart. And so if you're shooting at 13, you know, okay, I can shoot it, you know, one 500th of a second at whatever aperture and it works. There are a lot of numbers and a lot of situations on this chart. And I couldn't, even if I tried, would never remember them, but that's how a lot of old photographers used to shoot. And possible like enough so that Hasselblad made lenses with an exposure value chart built in that's not and those are the cameras like that that those are the cameras and lenses that went to the moon like that that original Hasselblad was the uh was the camera that they took for the moon landing that's a great fun fact I just learned today fuck yeah 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 I think they they that's awesome yeah I they and you can still buy I mean you said Jaime bought one, but like you can yeah, still buy those old rough. Hasselblads <laughs> and they're not like, well, I mean, they're expensive because everything in the film world right now is expensive, but Man. you can buy those old Hasselblads. And I had one for a short period of time that like didn't wind up working out. It wasn't right, the right camera for me, but it was like a 1957 Hasselblad that was like the original model and everything was like flawless it worked perfectly it did everything you needed to do it's crazy that it's like almost a 70 year old camera yeah I, it really is crazy and it's but it, like if you find them in great conditions i mean it's amazing I'm like because oh i know what it was because when we're talking about like when jaime got that camera me and i, I was telling jaime i wanted like an m6 like i was like yeah yeah that's my so, <laughs> so so when we both when he got his i he like there was, I was in, so I'm from Sacramento. Okay. And like, there's this Photoshop, they have used cameras and they had the M6. Okay. And it was not in working conditions, but it was like a good deal. And then, and also I had my rent coming up. So what I did is I, uh, we, we bought it and we, yes. we, and rent is, that was just the worst. Cause me and Jaime both bought it. Cause on original podcast, we were both like, we're like, we don't need these cameras. We're happy with what we got. And then he found it at a thrift store or thrift market or something. And he yeah. found the camera and then I found it at my whatever. And I got a repair. I took it to somewhere in, uh, actually, no, I, I took it down to Huntington Beach and some people down okay. there fixed it for me. And um, yeah, now it works. But like, it's, I guess the main point of the story is that like, it's the sharpness or these cameras, when you find them in good condition, it's crazy how they can shoot mm -hmm. versus like other cameras. Like that's what I'm realizing. Cause you talked about grainy and like yeah. how like, shots, like I was obsessed with that. Now, no, fuck that. <laughs> I am like, for the sharpness, I am trying to get like zero yeah. green. And yeah, uh, that's how I am too. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, and it's funny cause they're, they're you know, the, the big craze right now is these like point and shoots these like tiny little cameras that you can take everywhere and that they you don't do anything you just like turn it on you take some shots and like it does it all for you and i've got one the AE one got, program like that like that i mean that's not the point of the point and shoot for this camera but like just put it on program and then yeah you put it on program yeah and like these point and shoots are these tiny i mean they all are they basically just run on program mm -hmm. and and some of them you can set them to like aperture priority but like i have a contacts t2 which is like the the incredibly for whatever reason it's now incredibly expensive and it's like definitely not worth it but um people you just like turn it on that. yeah it's because like the celebrity like kendall jenner had one yeah <laughs> some fucking yeah i'm like jimmy fallon or some shit but people were killing um, it for us yeah and it like that like doubled the price overnight but um 
yeah, you like turn it on. That camera, you can set it to like, it's basically a program mode where it just like chooses everything for you based on what you aim your camera at. But it's crazy to me. And I, obviously I have one, so I know how dumb it is, but those cameras aren't repaired anymore. Like you can't get them fixed. You can't get them fixed because they're all electronic. And because they're so expensive these days and they're not made anymore, repair shops don't keep parts for those things. No, and that's... they don't like, if you're the, the constant joke is like, we all know they're just going to become really expensive paperweights at some point. Because when it fails, it fails. Hmm. The nice thing about a Leica M6 is that if but that German engineering, fails, man, like, uh, but like if it fails, I mean, there's only one thing that can really fail, which is the light meter. Yeah. And I, if the light meter fails, you, you can still use the camera. You don't need the light meter. Well, Everything I, else in that camera is mechanical, so you can get it fixed. No, exactly. But the light meter for me is my savior. Like, oh when, yeah, no, I, like I when I, I see those two, it. when I see the two arrows, that's <laughs> when I know. So like, yeah. that's my safe, cause I'm not like, I mean, if I gave this to my grandfather, I bet he probably wouldn't need a light meter. He probably could figure it out. Yeah. I do have not his me. other camera, but it's non-functional. It's just more of like you said, paperweight, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of there. It's all in German. Don't know what it's yeah. saying, but it's just like. What kind of camera is it, do you know? Do you mind if I go bring it right back? Please, Be please. You can just talk to the people. Say, yeah, I'll talk to the people. Quick. Well, well, people. If you uh, want us to know anything about film cameras, I'm sorry I've talked a lot, but oh, I'm excited. Oh, and you throw Rickenbacker back there. Oh, I gotta ask him about that. I hope it's been good. Whatever you guys were talking about. So, anyway, I was I was talking about. It, it looks like you have an old Rickenbacker back there. Yeah, you do. Good eye. Ah, yeah, Rickenbacker. I have. Man, bro, you you gotta come jam. I wanted one of those things for a long time. Yeah, we got a Rickenbacker the tape machine. Like it's a that's awesome. Like it's, it's like seventies music, sixty music. If you ever want to jam, I'm always like <laughs> awesome. I love through, that. Come through, like because yeah, we got that, and we're. I mean, this is off topic, but yeah, we're trying to invest into a Roland Space Echo right now to get that. Nice. Crazy. I wanted one of those things for such a long time. I mean, right now the price. Or there, I mean, this might sound a lot to people, but thousand dollars is not that much. That's not bad in music gear, as you know. They like, yeah, going like with preamps and all that stuff. It's ridiculous. So, yeah, one of my like colleagues just bought like one perfect condition, came from Japan. I don't know why in Japan they have everything there. Like, there are cameras too. They keep yeah. everything. It's perfect. It's amazing. Yeah, honestly, it's ridiculous. So. um yeah, man, come through sometime. We can jam out. But anyways, this is like his old Leica. So it has it on, I guess, right here, the case. And then he has it engraved in oh. Alfred Evans and his old street. Like, that's super cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So it's 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 an old, like, that's like the original. Is it a three? Uh, I'm not I'm not a Leica enough person. But those things, like, those are the original Leicas. The original rainfinders those things are oh, awesome and those things you they still sell them all over the place and people love those things yeah man i mean like i thought about selling but then i was like no this is just too like like it was his camera like he yeah. bought it in germany i don't know i don't know why it matters in germany but like just because that's where it's from oh, and right yeah yeah it, and there was like he had like this viewfinder thing on here like a little like i don't know what that was it's really like kind of like a telescope or just like it zooms yeah. a lot so i don't know what yeah so yeah you for for these old leicas um so they're like if you think about leica they're really they're like two big they call them camera bodies but that's the original one which they made a bunch of different versions of and then they switched to a different shape and style of body, which is what the M6 is. That's their like M series of cameras. So they look different. They function very similarly, but early Leicas only had frame lines for certain focal lengths. So they all only had, not all, but a lot of them only had frame lines for 
50 millimeter lenses. Mm. And so if you got a different focal length, like there are old Leicas, you can see that it's a 35 millimeter lens and it has built into the lens. It's got these, what they call goggles, which basically it's a magnifier for the viewfinder and for the rangefinder, So you can see the right focal length with those things. They would have a viewfinder that you'd like put in the top. Yep. So you could put a different lens and use a different focal length. Mm. Um, okay. So yeah, like the M6, it has like six different frame lines, I think. And if you want something that's not one of those six, you'd have to buy one of those viewfinders that sits on top. Yeah, I tried to put like, cause it's, it's in the drawer his, what he has, the, what you're talking about and throw it yeah. on them. It was like, no, this is not for this. Yeah. Camera. It's for this camera only. But I thought about like getting like repaired and like, Christmas coming. I know my dad shoots cameras, but he's cool. digital. Kind of restore it for him. Give this was his father's camera, and, and that would be so cool. I think that would be a cool gift for him. He doesn't watch this podcast, I don't think. So you know, <laughs> this year, well, happy early Christmas. Pop. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas. But yeah, those things that that like a you you can still do this actually with like a is you can send it if you have a, a like a camera, you can send it to like a. So actually like, they may have stopped a couple of years ago but you can get them to engrave the top plate with whatever you want really and so it used to be really common where people would get their name and their address and whatever on top of the camera um they may have stopped it a couple of years ago but like you could if you bought a new leica camera up till a few years ago from leica you would just tell them that you wanted it specially engraved that's cool. And so mean, it's always cool to see these pop up with like personal information. That's like awesome. Yeah, that's why I like I see like Alfred Evans on here, just like you know, because he you know he moved to Connecticut and that's where my father lived and everything. You just see yeah, you see seven six one Green Hill Road, Madison, Connecticut. Like that's so like, cool. Whoever, I'd be great if someone actually lived there and was listening to this. You just said my street. Just, <laughs> I would love that. But yeah, it's I don't know. It's very like. That's why I think with any, like any creativity, it's so amazing how it can, it's like, it becomes an artifact, like take vinyl, vinyl is an artifact. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how like you have this thing in your hands and then you open it and you see the amazing pictures and you're reading the lyrics and it's like, yeah, it's, it's something so beautiful. It's the same with film. Like you find a scrapbook of like your relatives and you just see all the photos that they're taking back then. And yeah, uh, my like grandfather, like he was way better handwriting than I had uh, <laughs> in my scrapbook like he would write down the date and specifically explain what was happening of course it's in German so I don't know what it was fully saying but like I remember I was just asking my dad and he was saying it says like right here like him and his buddy went to go uh see a movie and got like coke like coca-cola for like a dollar or something and I was like wow that's not like what it is now like <laughs> yeah um, I would never think to write that shit down but oh yeah I I've got my binder of negatives and i'm it's like i don't know it makes me feel a little cool to have like all these negatives sitting around and you like, ever make a book though like you see some people do like because i mean i would i would buy one of yours <laughs> <laughs> it's funny i've thought a lot about that in the last couple months of like would i do it absolutely i think for me i need a like I would want it to be a specific project. Like I don't want to just publish a book of my favorite shots because they don't work together. And like some of my favorite photo books of all time are these like projects that people have done, these old photographers in the 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever. And they, it's like a project where you're photographing a small town, like famous youtuber and photographer like yeah, i guess instagram are also matt day if, okay, you don't, yeah. if you've never seen if you've never seen his youtube channel go check him out um he put a book together um about his hometown he lives in some small town in ohio and it was basically just like a bunch of photographs over the course of i don't know how long and showcasing how it's changed how the town has changed over the years that's really and cool. they may not like when you look at it if he posted one of those shots to instagram you'd be like okay whatever but when they're all together it's 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 meaningful and you can see how they all work together and you're getting 
like more than just a picture of a shop, like an abandoned shopping cart on the side of the road. You get, yeah, you get a story. You get it's like an like, album. Exactly, exactly. And so I don't think, I don't know what a project like that would look like for me. I, I and I want it to kind of come naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I, I wish I, I have had figured that out by now. And I would love to do it, but and I think that's I gotta okay. wait. I think, I think it like, I think that's the biggest thing here is that what Grantastic's about. It's like it comes when it comes. It, you can't yeah. force anything. Like that's yeah. like that's something I truly believe in, and I try to preach to anyone who wants to listen or don't listen. Either one. It, <laughs> it, it's basically about just like you can't force what will happen I, the universe will will present itself to you when yeah. the time is right because i don't know what it is in this world but like things happen for a reason and some yep. of it's shitty some of it's great but there's a reason behind it and we it's bigger than us so i think when the time's right for you to uh, drop a book it will happen and i think you that's just the thing and maybe it's black and white who knows your first yeah book, yeah that, honestly that would that's be, a good point that would be cool like you waited and like maybe that's what happens like Hear me, hear me out with my weird story. You, you <laughs> meet you? this amazing black and white photographer in SF. Like, like he's kind of quiet, but like you look him up, and he's like, "Fuck, this man has amazing photos." And he takes you under his wing. He shows yeah. you the ways, and then you start. You shoot all this in a year, and then boom, you drop it. And it's- all right. So what I'm gathering from this is that there's someone out there who's a really amazing black and white photographer who is quiet and lives in San Francisco. Let me know where you're at hit me up i'm around take me under your wing teach me your ways yeah man i like, think let me know hopefully he looks at youtube or listens to spots <laughs> i mean but yeah i think it's i think that's also a mate the best thing about like at least i realized in the film communities like people are very gracious and people are very like at least yeah. i found like they're very just open and not like afraid to give information versus the music world everyone's like you keep it shut no one wants to tell you how to mix or master certain tracks yeah. like how they get that certain sound everyone's like greedy uh at yeah. least in the producer way um yeah i met some some really great people here who are like and i think that's one of the great things like you said about this film community it seems to be in my experience it's been this way that like people want to help and I don't know what it is, what's different about this community, because I've been in plenty of music you know, communities in general. Like music was, guitar is always, guitar is a tough one. Like there is a, like, I remember wanting to go buy my first guitar and not even my first, my second or third, and like go to Guitar Center or whatever store. And like, I sit down to try it out and I feel so embarrassed by like what i'm playing and i don't want to play too loudly because i don't want to be like a shitty guitarist i get it but in the film community like no one really gives a fuck like it is what it is Mm -hmm. and it's been cool to i've learned so much from so many different photographers um and again i know we talked about it before but like i'm talking photographers with 300 followers and 300 000 followers and like it's great. I went on a photo walk two weeks ago with, and I didn't know this at the time, but a friend that I've met through here, another guy who has, and, and these numbers are actually real, not made up. Uh, that guy has like 600 followers. Found that out later. The other guy has 670,000 followers. And they were all completely down to earth, awesome people who even just in the two hours we were shooting, like taught me a lot. I had so many questions. I knew nothing about these people. Didn't know that one of them was like this huge big time yeah. photographer. Like it's his full-time job. But we were just like shooting the shit, talking about like different things. And it was great. And I left kind of assuming that we were all just photographers in this community. And that's cool. I've talked to them all since and it's super cool. It's yeah. Super cool. That's that's how it should be for every kind of like artistic kind of thing because I think the definitely the ones that like who 
I don't know how to word it, but like at least like the musicians who I've known, like they're I guess famous. You want to say they're always down to earth. At least in yeah, my case. like won't give names, but like they they're doing great now and like they're thriving on the charts and like they came to visit because they had a show here um, a few weeks ago and like got to hang out because we a friend of a friend and like they're just like down to earth they're just playing super smash bros in my apartment with me <laughs> like we're just chilling and i'm just like this is great and like they they, they yeah. talk about the same issues or this they have the same thoughts and it's like they're human like us and why should we yeah. treat other people like this and i don't know like i think the music industry is just kind of especially with like listen i love jazz jazz me too I, that's I, my I, thing you know bill evans is my hero you're speaking my that's my i've always said bill evans is like my guy and I always have been like, maybe I'm related. No, I know I'm not. Literally, I know I'm not. We but all, maybe. all us three Evans guys out here, you know, <laughs> like, maybe there's a weird origin or something. But um, it's a dream. But yeah, like, with, like not to get off topic of the film, but for film people who maybe will listen to this, you know, Bill Evans, check him out. Amazing pianist. Part amazing. Miles Davis did, you know, a lot. Was the king of like voicings and harmonies of what those chords. Um, but like there's some people who I met, like they're like, fuck every other genre. Like jazz is the most purest thing. And like we yeah, talk about purest totally. like people, and but they're like the old heads, like trying to yep. make full circle here. It's like they they don't they need to uh appreciate, understand other creativity ideas or genres. Mm -hmm. Like I understand jazz is a hard genre it can be very complex with the time signatures and mm -hmm. and then we get into samba and all that stuff it's yeah. ridiculous but like you got to be open-minded and like so far everyone's been super cool in the film community like yeah um shout out again hi May. <laughs> <laughs> literally he's gonna laugh when he sees this um he was the first like photographer who like followed me and like and still today like i I literally talk to him every day, like literally like That's awesome. He's just a great person. And he just like always giving me um, tips and just like, and just actually just knowledge. And it's, it's like not fake knowledge, not like yeah, how, yeah. how to make a quick beat or how to do this in five seconds. Yeah. Like, no, this is how you got to do it. And he's like, okay, go check out this photographer and like we actually buy his book and look at how he shoots. Like actually mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and like, this is what I'm looking for. I want like real people who actually care and like, and are willing to just give some time. That's all I'm asking. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and maybe in return, some music or <laughs> some food. Fuck it. I'm always down, you know, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's super great. That's great to hear that. Um, you got to meet these people and stuff. And yeah. would you say like COVID right now? Um, Cause like, did you start, you started film photography before COVID? no during during COVID. so yeah, like yeah so so what it has it been feel like now meeting up with people i mean like because has it like you're hoping to get more of that now i'm assuming and just like yeah i mean it's been the first the first person that invited me to go shoot was and i i mentioned his name before but eddie grog I think and I uh yeah, and and Marco, I think his Instagram is sh is shot by Bush. If you're looking for both of them, Eddie's is Eddie Grog. But um, just like out of the blue, Eddie was like, "Yo, we're gonna be in San Francisco." They're from Sacramento, or he's from Sacramento. Oh, really? He's like, we're gonna be in San Francisco, and uh, we're gonna go here. Let me know if you wanna tag along. And I was like, "Dope." I I don't I don't know these guys. I've never done like. Yeah. And I was like, th this. I used to buy and sell music equipment all the time on Craigslist. And I was like, this feels like it could be some shady Craigslist shit where I'm like meeting up with some random dude on Instagram. But like, that's just kind of the way of our, our world these days, but they were super awesome. And it was a lot of fun and met up with them a couple of times since and like met up with other people. And I think if unsolicited advice if you're ever looking for to learn something if you ever want to just like get out there and shoot like ask someone 
that you like that you know is in your area if you follow somebody on instagram if you like their work if they're a good photographer like what's the worst that can happen they say no exactly and like some somebody one of my followers just moved to san francisco and like literally like last week or two weeks ago and she reached out last week and was like hey i just moved here um i'm a film photographer but i would love to get out and shoot i don't really know what's going on around here and so i think she and her boyfriend are gonna come shoot and that's awesome yeah i think so more of that (laughs) no yeah i think more like love how we're bringing the 60s in today more of like you know like the old put the thumbs up you get in the car i mean yeah don't do that today folks unless yeah don't yeah, it, yeah. It, we got a weird world we're living in right now but like, <laughs> i think people should be more open and you know i know yeah. trust is a hard thing nowadays so like really you don't know them you don't know what their intentions and all this stuff but i think at least in the film world people have good intentions they just want to shoot and learn and just build yeah. con- build friendships and connections and I definitely like feel that for sure in music and here like I just want to like build a community because like when you move somewhere new you feel that loneliness and you feel totally. and it, it, it you feel like what am I doing and you feel small in a big city or a big town or whatever you want to call it here and yeah you just want to connect with others and people who are just open-minded because sometimes people can like have that resting bitch face and like you totally. just you off and like yeah but really they can be the same yeah. person yep yeah i i i encourage it i understand that it's not like the easiest thing to do all the time um but in my experience like once once somebody invited me to do it once it was like oh great i get to go meet new people i get to go shoot and i get to learn new things because they aren't they don't think about the same things that i do they don't think about shooting in the same way i do they don't do whatever and like eddie and i happen to have the same camera but we shoot very different styles and so it was really cool to see his process and see how he thinks about things and go home and be like you know i'm gonna start doing that i'm gonna start i'm gonna try that i'm gonna do whatever and so it's it's been a cool um a cool way to learn and actually get to meet people oh yeah oh yeah i'm just trying to wait when someone just posts a whole meetup for like the film group in sf like i am yeah there there are some there are some i haven't gone to any but there are some um i don't know if they've met at all recently but i remember i remember i was out of town for one a few months ago and uh i think there were like 30 people that showed up oh shit! i was like damn and there's one there's one in the east bay there's some like oakland uh, street photographers group or something like that and I try to follow them just because like I'm not a street photographer I live in San Francisco but like I drive out there it's easy yeah not a bad drive at all totally yeah I'm seeing that's the beauty of it like there's no there's like you said like they don't care or like they're not going to judge you I should say about like if you're starting out or you're learning or whatever like the I think they just appreciate that someone who appreciates what they appreciate is just yeah. out there with them. And like, yeah. it's always great to get knowledge. Knowledge is something I always say, like, it's something so valuable and that I feel like everyone should try to like obtain it. And yeah. from your own experience, just pass it on to other people. So I think it's totally, uh, it's funny. There, there's, you know, within the film community, there are definitely people that are like, they're not famous, but like in the film community, they're like kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. And I found over, like maybe a month ago that there's one guy who's probably in his late fifties who just like, he works or he was, he was a Kodak ambassador for a really long time and he's been shooting forever. And like, he's one of those guys that like is just around and is always willing to help out. And is like met up with a bunch of people and shot film with a bunch of people and like, gives people film and like he's just a cool guy in the community who like wants nothing other than to be a part of the community which is super cool that is that is great honestly we need more of that in every creative aspect because yeah first of all film is so goddamn expensive it's ridiculous and like if someone i think was showing me that was like kodak's gonna raise their film or something by this after this year and stuff and it's like 
It's like, Jesus Christ, like I'm already yeah. trying to catch up from rent because of this camera and now like yeah. all this other stuff. And it's like, yeah, they're raising, they're raising certain prices of like, like a five pack of Portra 400 is going to be raised, I think like 20%. So it's going to be, I think currently it's like $64, 60 something dollars. And now it's going to be like 80 bucks, 75, 80 bucks, which I'm like, I don't, I don't. I don't have time for that. Yeah, like I don't have time for that. At this point, you should just make your own film. I don't know how hard yeah. that is, but like there's some there's there's a Instagram slash YouTuber Rib Ribsy, I think his name is. He made his own film pretty recently. And I don't know how hard it is. I don't know what it turns out to be, but like yeah. look it up. Yeah. He made his own. No, definitely will. Yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you. I'm gonna grab one thing. This is the dunk. It's like I'm happy with the purchase, but also it's ridiculous. No, go Speaking for it. Film prices, I'll show you. We're all for it. So this film, Fuji yeah. Pro 400H. You, you, I remember on your thing, you said they, they went extinct. It was hard to find it. Was that you? Yeah. Okay. So they, they Fuji discontinued this film at the beginning of this year, I want to say. Okay. And this is this was Fuji's equivalent of Portrait 400. So it's like the professional grade, uh, really fine grain, really sharp film that like portrait photographers use. Okay. They discontinued it. Now, because it's literally nowhere, I bought this single roll for, I think it was $25. Jesus Christ. For one single roll of film. Now, why did I do that? I don't know. Fuji colors are, I think it's beautiful. It's a beautiful film, but it's sitting in my fridge and I don't know if I'm ever going to use it because I'm too afraid to spend $25. But the book, the book, the book, maybe that's what it is. It's all Fuji Pro 400H. Yeah. But yeah, you, you can you can look on eBay and it's like 10 packs of this shit is like 250 bucks. 10 rolls of film for 250 bucks. I'm like, this is it sucks Bro, and it sucks that they're discontinuing these things i mean that and as well as we live in san francisco if you if i don't know but gas prices and food and all it's like and rent as you already know like it's yeah what's another 25 five dollar roll of film you know yeah it's already it's crazy how everything's like prices and, and that's the thing i wonder like in the next let's say 30 years for us like where will fin film stand and where like will prices like will it just be ridiculous at the point where it just no one's gonna buy or like we start have to make yeah. our own it's there there's a shout out to another i keep dropping these names but oh, another wow. bay area youtuber and instagram guy chris chu i think his instagram is who is chris chu he put a really great and i actually just shouted him out the other day too but he um he put a really good video together on YouTube about this whole conversation and like what's going to happen to film and like prices are going up. Is it going to die out? Like, I think it's, I don't know. I, I look at it and I'm like, okay, you used to be able to buy a roll of film for like, I don't know, two bucks, three bucks way back in the day. So like, I'm sure that these prices relative to inflation and stuff aren't that crazy, but it's still increasing and like, it's not as common. Yeah. I think my assumption, and I, I've heard this before too, that like Kodak charging so much more money and they recently put out a new disposable camera, the new, it, it shoots black and white triax instead of or whatever color that they're doing all of this and jacking up prices so they can reinvest in their processes and like make things better long term and then hopefully bring back some old um it, like you know extinct film stocks and stuff i don't know if that's true but my optimistic hope is that they're doing all of this to better it in the long run and yeah. that it's not all just for profit and whatever I no i don't know who the president right now is at kodak but i hope that they get their shit together and i hope there's a reason for all of this because yeah. i don't want to drop 80 bucks on portra for no reason 
that could have bought you your groceries. Yeah. Genuinely. Yeah. And we got, we all need to eat to get that thinking going. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, well, like you were talking about, so would you say the best way for people who actually want to do this and like, actually like maybe a hobby or maybe not a hobby is to just get it developed and then scan it on your own. And then I guess if you wanted to print it, then you just go back and get it printed. I mean, economically, developing chemicals are not very expensive. Like you can you can buy a starter pack and get all your dev stuff for not that much. Um, Is it hard? And I mean, it's hard in that the first time or two is just scary because you're afraid of screwing up your film and whatever. Um, but I think it seems like it's one of those things that's way scarier than it actually is. And like, once you do it twice, mm -hmm. you know how it works and it's like not a big deal. Um, and right now for me, the lab that's closest is like, I don't know, six or seven bucks for development per roll. Mm. I think if I started doing it on my own, it's like, it would be so much cheaper, but for me, I would rather scan on my own. And I, I like, there's some, there's some like price point that it makes sense if you're shooting enough. And if you're scanning enough, like scans are 15 bucks for me and I don't want to spend 15 bucks every roll. Um, so for me, it was just easier to pay up front. I had a digital camera, bought a lens, like made that setup. Um, but if you're not shooting as often, if you're shooting, you know, a couple rolls here and there, it's probably just easier to scan with a lab. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to find the good price range. You know, we went to Underdogs and then we went to Oscars because Oscars is where I work close by there. And it's like good places. Yeah. With everything. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's, and I've had film developed in, in a handful of places and like, I mean, first of all, shout out to all of the film labs and you know, everywhere that are still still making it work because it's awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just it, it's it's about what makes the most sense for you. Like, I shoot enough that I would prefer to scan on my own, um, and I think the 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 money I've saved from scanning at home has more than paid for the camera setup that i have for it oh yeah definitely so yeah I, I think it just depends what your situation is and like uh how much you're using the camera and stuff so yeah yeah but yeah. then that's like you know you have a like uh um inspired me and other people for sure well you and joe greer i mean those were the two people <laughs> i saw like i mean particularly joe greer when i saw that thing and i was like there you go that like yeah but the main point of where I'm going with this is, is with your camera, would you ever, have you, have you ever done client's work with it? Or is this more, because when you get into client's work and that's what I'm doing with the music, you, your love for it changes a it little changes, bit. Yeah. Headlines come along, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't done any paid work or client work with this camera. I had before when I was shooting digital yeah. and you're right. I mean, it's a job at that point. And so it's different. Um, would I do client? Well, I mean, sure. I, if somebody's going to pay me to do this, like, yeah, I'll obviously do it. But I think it would be different. It would be different. And I would be, yeah. Yeah, it would be different. It changes your mindset and it changes yeah. how you shoot, especially because we talked about you do like landscapes and everything now people want maybe a port it would change the whole yeah especially i mean what what um if you don't mind what lens do you use like i'm assuming 28 because if it's landscape or is it i'm i'm you know it's funny i have a, for my leica i have a 35 and a 50 my 35 is currently with leica getting some work done and the entire time i'm like i feel like i should just get a 28 instead but anyway yeah okay yeah yeah um well come through i have the 28 if you ever want to all right that's all you if you ever absolutely want um because it was it was not in the best shape but it's doing good okay now but yeah, main, whatever main point what i'm saying is that like i think it's 
because definitely if like I think it would be interesting to see more people hire film photographers I know at least in my like I don't know how old you are I'm 23 but a lot of my friends like who are like 20 21 especially as artists like they're yeah. like want more film for like their like yeah album or cd covers or whatever their spotify page that's like been a big thing in the music industry that is like yeah increasing. and someone said like i'll pay you 50 dollars if you just take photos of me with my guitar and i was like i'll do it I'm like fuck okay like i don't think yeah. I realize i told them film's expensive but I never gave them a price and they're like well fuck bro i'll give you money if you need it I just want the photos and yeah okay it's not that expensive but i'm not gonna say anything. yeah like <laughs> yeah the, i mean there are there are definitely photographers getting consistent paid work who only shoot film and i think it's awesome i mean i yeah. think it's 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 the style right like if you want that style and that look mm -hmm. it's a look for sure it works it really know? does and i think it's such a cool and that's where like like a goal of mine um is to bring like now i know you we have a connection we were on this fantastic again thank you so much is yeah. that now that you know me i would love to introduce you to like musicians because like i've totally. shown i've shown them your work and they're like wow and like bringing this up because some maybe some have asked would you ever shoot so like it's absolutely like, and you yeah, make you're looking and you play guitar so like yeah it's like creative minds like yeah you shoot but you also if you ever want to jam or just have fun yeah Going because like everyone just wants to connect and that's what totally. i'm trying to do here and just like totally. um yeah but i also feel like i don't know how like your work that work ethic is but would you say when something becomes a job does it change your love for it would you say mm -hmm. uh i think it depends how you can handle it separate okay. the two right like for me my normal shooting style is, you know, landscape, cityscape, whatever. And if I got a paid gig that was like portraits, I think it would be different enough for me that I wouldn't lose my passion for mm. landscapes. Now, if I was getting like, if, if a few years ago, like the big thing on Instagram was like these travel lifestyle photographers who would like live in a van and just travel the national parks and yep. <laughs> you know get paid to promote like a pendleton blanket or like a patagonia jacket or some shit like that and like for them their life is their job right like they're on the road because they're getting paid to be on the road and use those products so i think that's probably where it's a little different but yeah would you say because i think you mentioned before like because I honestly thought this is your job is film. I thought like, but love to hear. It. I mean, that's just, again, Jaime, that's not his job. I mean, you guys just yeah. love it. But would you ever, unless you love your job, would you ever want this to become your like every day? People have asked me that before. I, I, I don't think so. At least not right now. I don't think so. And I know plenty of professional photographers who like this is their job and it's awesome. Um, I, yeah, I think for me, it's a little bit too uh, volatile in terms of like what work, like there's not necessarily a consistent work stream. Like I have a full-time job and I know that I have that full-time job mm -hmm. yeah. and it's consistent and my paychecks are consistent and whatever. And it, I like routine a little bit. So it's nice to have that. No, it's nice to have the safety of like a paycheck for sure. I yeah. I get it. Like being an audio engineer, audio engineer it's like yeah. who's coming to to get yeah, reported. Same thing, right? Like I don't know who's gonna be my like unless you're like working for a company and they hand you a project. That is definitely I think the best way because you're guaranteed. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I uh, yeah. I think that's that's part of the reason. The other thing is kind of what you were saying before. I love photography and I don't want to lose that love because it's what I do all the time and I know a couple of people even just through Instagram that like they are professional wedding photographers and stuff and they also shoot film and do their normal thing but like that feels like for me at least and just the way I live my life like that's too 
much and I don't want that to be the only thing I do. I totally understand. I think you need to have like, again, we talked about having a balance. I think, you know, it's good to like step away from something, you know, and like, so you have your job and then you go do film because now like you see maybe, I don't know what you do, but like you see in the window, if there's a window, like, oh, a beautiful thing where you want yeah. to touch a photo and then like it gets you inspired. Like yeah. that's why I do like the music and then it makes me go outside. And then when I'm outside, I hear all these sounds and it makes me like, okay, I wish pull out my phone, record it and then try to sample it and make something good and go back into the studio. So like, yeah, I think it's a great thing about, you know, cause you can never have, if you have too much of one thing, it's too much. And it just yeah, like, totally. It's overwhelming. And it over. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And then I guess the other, other than this is the only other question is like, what that I like have on my like notes and stuff is like, what made you choose the M or like, you have an M6, I believe. Yeah. What made yeah. you choose the M6? I mean, I know everyone like, like it's the M6, but like there's, there could be a reason like, Wow. I mean, what made me choose that particular camera? I think. How quiet it is and it just kind of lets you focus doing your job or like shooting. Or... Yeah, well, it was my first time ever shooting. It was probably a bad idea. It was my first time ever shooting a rangefinder. So um, I didn't know what that experience was like. But I think for me, in my head, it was kind of like, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to sell all my digital stuff and like go into film, I might as well get the camera that will inspire me the most. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I'm fully on board with the idea of like, there are so many cameras out there and you can make amazing images with so many, like any camera really. Yeah. And it doesn't matter the price. Like if Leica fell off the face of the earth and never existed again, there would be just as many talented photographers and like nothing would really change. That said, I think, and you know, people talk about that all the time. Like you don't need expensive gear. You don't need, gear doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I think that's true to an extent. And in my case, I think it was true that like gear, when you, when you don't have the right gear, it can limit you in terms of how you feel inspired and creative like yeah i had sony cameras really amazing cameras really nice lenses all amazing gear like top of the line gear mm -hmm. but it wasn't that th those pieces of equipment were not inspiring me to get out and shoot and they weren't inspiring me to try new things no yeah and this like a camera did and like i have old nikon film cameras that were like 100 bucks and those are great um but whatever it is about this leica i keep picking it up and I keep wanting it and I keep coming back to it every single day totally. and anytime I see it I'm like oh I want to go out and shoot and that to me gear whatever the gear is whether it's a $50 camera or a $5,000 camera if it makes you feel that way that's the important part uh, well said I totally <laughs> I totally feel it you know what I mean because like um I think for sure and like you know this podcast I'm we're always honest or whatever like I, I was I was hesitant to bring up about my m6 because I've like I mean I've been I've been shooting for almost a year now and stuff and for sure yeah. like someone starting off m6 it's like what but it's also like like seeing my grandfather shoot with that camera like as we've seen in this podcast episode it's like there's a connection with it and like of course I yeah. started with a you know a Canon AE1 it's not a rangefinder but you know get the fantastic base. camera it really is and like I still some of these shots um I've taken on it have been amazing and I love it I still use it today but yeah with the Leica it it makes me feel like I'm with my grandfather if that makes yeah, sense. yeah totally like totally. like even though it's not the same camera like there's like this weird feeling I have like he's there with me so yeah. um and, and for you that's super important I know plenty of people who hate Leica and they tried it and it doesn't work for yeah. them and that's perfectly great for me it makes it means something to me for you it means something to you and like I think I think it's important to look past all that gear stuff I know it's super I get sucked into the gear thing all the time of like oh I want a new lens oh, I want a new camera but like 
use what you at the have. end of the day yeah at the end of the day if it makes you if it inspires you to shoot if it makes you do better work even if it's just because of your head i mean no i yeah great said i think honestly yeah and i think what you have and like you know what i'm trying to shoot right now at least like um you know i like landscape photos like you're saying but i also like street photography and i think the yeah. 28 is great for that and like yeah um though we're working on like like most of my shots if you look on and well not all of them but like the ones that have like done super well are me in the car with my jeep in the window and it's going fast and but it's like i always get the lighting perfectly and yeah, those yeah. photos are going crazy and it's like a i'm gonna be honest i don't know really what i'm fully like i just looking at the two light meters boom i hit i have an idea yeah. but like trying to work on shooting like while moving because like with my cannon it's hard point and shoot was easy shot it here yeah. trying to get people moving and also when i'm in some locations where i shouldn't be at the moment like i got i'm just trying to get the photo so it's been a challenge but in a good way and um yeah i think it's it's great and it's interesting uh how a camera can make you feel and 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 also how it makes you think like that yeah that's totally interesting. how how because when I first started shooting with this, I mean, I understood my dad explained it to me a little about like the range finder. It's not like the Canon A1. It's not, well, it's not a, it's a, uh, it's not a range finder. So you're yeah. not looking into what your lens is seeing. So realizing that, cause I remember the first roll I got, it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's different. Yeah. No. Yeah. For all, um, yeah. We're, we're just the, the main thing folks, people, cause I'm kind of like, drifting here is that do what you love follow yeah. your dreams and don't give a fuck what anyone else is thinking i think that's the biggest thing that that's is it that's the, that's the moral of this entire episode <laughs> it, it really is because i think we all overthink and like kind of going full circle with the instagram thing people have this idea or this mindset of like they want approval from their yeah. like colleagues or other people or their fans or whatever and it's like at the end of the day like yeah that's great but you're forgetting why you're here like mm -hmm. you, the point is this because you're doing you you think the yeah. beatles gave a fuck with like everyone else no and as as uh, we as we saw if you have seen the get back documentary amazing documentary plugging that for disney plus go see it it's amazing um yeah that's where i'm gonna leave it yeah totally yeah it's uh don't give a shit also you you my view on it is like you got to be a fan of yourself. Like I have to be a fan of my own work. And if I'm not a fan of my own work, I'm either not doing the right thing for myself or I'm doing it for somebody else and I don't like it. So yeah, be a fan I, of your own work. Exactly. Really believe in yourself. That's, that's really important. I think in any creative aspect, but yeah, yeah. Um, that is basically it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on to Grantastic. Anything you want to let the people know going on in your life or they should, or <laughs> uh i mean hey i i you know all my my stuff's on on instagram i've got a website but it's it's um i mean my big shout out is just to all the people who have been super supportive along the way super helpful i've learned a lot from a lot of other people um and i'm excited to continue doing it so thank you for having me this was awesome really enjoyed yeah. this conversation yeah man i really did too and thank you for just being open-minded coming on here and like it's always Thanks great so. talking to to like any people who are just like creative minded and just always wanted to just meeting people and hearing about yeah. the story and like and yeah honestly <laughs> it's great to know that you live in San Fran love to hear it yeah uh, yeah man but anyways fantastic people out there if you've listened to this I don't know how long this podcast has been we appreciate you stay hydrated and keep on flourishing there we go